Hi all, hopefully you're here to hear a presentation about the science of human behaviour and what motivates us to react to certain behaviours, internal and external stimuli, and yes, I'm talking beyond beer, coffee and waffles. So, before we jump into the exciting part, it's best I introduce myself. My name is William Dorrington and I have the great pleasure of heading up the power platform for Hitachi Solutions Europe. I also get to play an active role in the TDG community and I'm a Microsoft Business Application MVP. To me, my career is my lifestyle, my passion, and I hope today I get to share some of that with you all. One of the most important slides. It is impossible to hold these absolutely fantastic events and ensure they are kept free of charge without sponsorship. So with thanks to Script Runner, GQ Global, Proximo3, Redspire, Agilisys, and Hitachi Solutions for your sponsorship. You are all truly awesome. So today we are going to look at the rather interesting topic of gamification or human-focused design. We will together explore the history, the definitions, the science, different models, and how it is applied and some possible disastrous outcomes. Now a quick disclaimer, there is so much to cover when it comes to human behavioural science and what makes us tick and occasionally talk. So to cover off the agenda for today in only 45 minutes, it's going to take some energy and some incredibly fast talking. Due to the pace, it won't always allow me to apply it back to solutions, but I've tried to ensure to cover applications of the more complex frameworks or principles. However, I'll be available to discuss any items later via Q&A or reach out to me on the various social networks. Right, let's go. So. Gamification seems to be another buzzword that is thrown around, and as we know, buzzwords in the technology world usually leads to misunderstanding. We've all been in those conversations with our friends where they're talking about the glorious beauty of AI that turns out it's three if statements in a rather colourful Excel spreadsheet. So let's go beyond the buzzword today, and to kick it off, let's define gamification. Now, to get to the definition, we must look at the history, and the history of gamification is something that I adore walking through. There's been many giants that have helped mature and broaden our understanding of gamification. Up first is Sperry and Hutchison. They were founded in 1896 and operated a rewards program that allowed retailers to sign up to be part of it for a fee. This then enabled retailers to give their customers stamps at the till, which could then be redeemed via their catalogue for prizes. This rewards program really took off in the 1930s, and it was incredibly successful. Also, we must mention the Boy Scouts, who motivated young children from the 1910 onwards for becoming proficient in performing useful activities or skills and staying true to the Scouts of Conduct, and much more, via warding them with badges that they wore proudly on themselves. Quite some time passed after the Boy Scouts badge system before the idea of adding game mechanics to work. In 1973, Charles Kunrat wrote a book titled The Game of Work. This was born out of his curiosity of why the productivity in the US was slipping, but there was a huge uptake in the sales of sporting equipment. He noticed workers would happily take leave to go on long treks through the forest hunting, snowboarding, and playing week-long basketball, which is more exhausting work. He pondered how it was that people paid to work together towards a common goal struggled to achieve real teamwork. However, a team playing basketball could work together with little friction. Charles realized it was down to five key areas, clearly defined goals, scorekeeping and scorecards, frequent feedback and ability to make personal choices and consistent coaching. Let's jump to 1978 to 80, where we saw the emergence of the frequent flyer programs. Texas International Airlines were the first to adopt a frequent flyer program, which used track mileage to award their customers. Along with this, the likes of Holiday Inn, National Rental Car and many others joined in with their own versions of the reward programs. It wasn't long until we saw a mass adoption of this, which not only led to more loyal consumers and customers, but also large volumes of incredibly valuable data. Now, it's incredibly important to mention that also in the same period, around 1978, the first online social-driven corporation game was launched by Rob Trubshaw and Richard Bartle, called the Multi-User Dungeon, or MUD1. It began to pave the way for online gaming as we know it today. This was a necessary step towards gamification as well, recognising the cooperative nature of individuals in an online game setting. Now, gaming had a huge impact in allowing the study of motivation and conditioning acceptance of gaming mechanisms. If we can sidestep the flow of time for one moment and jump into 1990, where Nintendo has managed to put a home console in 30% of American households. The Nintendo's popularity saw the gaming craze spread to millions of people around the globe. This huge growth is similar to that 
to MUD1. It doesn't directly relate to gamification, but it definitely affects it. Those who adopted this gaming interest make up a significant group often referred to as the millennials. The proliferation of video games had a major impact in conditioning people to accept and appreciate these games and their various components. Part of the success of gamification has to do with our acceptance of these, me these mechanics and cannot go unnoticed. In the 1980s, academics started to wade in and look at the benefits of gamification. Thomas Malone, a professor at MIT, released multiple academic papers recognizing the potential of video games and how it provided intrinsic motivation that could be harnessed outside the constraints of only game design. He then went on to write on how these could be applied to other environments, especially education. The academics kept pouring in. Stephen Draper, a senior lecturer of psychology at the University of Glasgow, started looking at how fun needs to be assessed as a requirement for software design and determined that enjoyment is necessary. Nick Pelling, whilst developing a game-like interface for an ATM in 2003, Three, coins the purposely ugly word gamification because he saw it as what the game industry was doing to everything else. Also during this time, the Woodrow Wilson International Center of Scholars began the Serious Game Initiative. The idea was to create games that would educate people on politics, environmentalism, health, and other important subjects. This is not exactly gamification, but serious games, which we will cover later. In 2005, Bunchball was founded, which still exists today. The company's services were all focused around gamification, especially focused on websites and boosting engagement by adding game mechanics. Their first major platform release was Dunder Mifflin Infinity, which was a gamified social network where people could connect with each other, form an office and compete in tasks that allowed them to earn shroot bucks, which could be redeemed to alter the individual's online office, which players could then visit. All the different Dunder Mifflin branches were in competition, where if successful, they could win real world prizes. Chore Wars, created by Kevin Davis, was launched in 2007, which was another huge step towards modern gamification, allowing adults, children, and everybody in between to be incentivized to carrying out their chores. This proved a huge success. It's 2009, and platforms taking on gamification continues, this time with Foursquare, which encourages users to search and explore around them. They then can collect badges and see where they are on a leaderboard, as well as becoming the mayor of a particular location by checking in the most times, more than anyone else, in essence, it's a gamified map. This allowed for Foursquare to monetize promotions of locations and build a very accurate map based purely on user data that was also fact-checked by the users themselves. Genius. Right, let's pick up the pace because we have six more years to cover. TED Talks start to happen in 2010. One of note is by the American game designer Jane McConigal, where she makes the postulation where we ch can change the world with games. Games like World of Warcraft can see large up to 50 person units carry out game tasks. If that could be turned into real world energy, imagine what we could conquer. Also in 2010, Gabe Sickerman releases his book on game-based marketing. The term coined by Nick Pelling gamification gets more and more traction. 2011 hits. Big gamification summits start taking place. More books and papers are released on a topic. Various workshops about using game mechanics in a non-traditional way take place also. Gamification for verification happens via are you a human? Then only capture the duck in this net, proving you're a human. IoT tracking starts to emerge to push gamification into aspects of life like health. 2012, okay, let's speed this up further. Gartner added gamification to its hype circle, but although states 80% of current gamified applications will primarily fail due to poor design. Badge fill that helps measure and influence users' behavior for companies got over 20 million pound funding, and also Zombies Run, the fitness game launches, and that's still going strong to today. 2013, Gamification 2013 conferences took place across US, Canada, and many other countries, bringing together research from multiple industries and topics. Sickerman's talk on the gamification revolution was highlighted as the most popular talk at the Gamification Summit. And also during this year, Amazon ties gamification into Kindle, focusing on rewarding children for reading. As Gardner predicted, gamification was on a hype trajectory, but due to poor design and bad implementation, a large majority of gamification initiatives failed, which started to appear in public. Applications. A notable failure was the Marriott International Hotel. The game's main goal was focused on attracting future employees and training them. It had players take on the role of a hotel hospitality manager, where you manage budgets, hire and train employees. However, it only focused on the company's goals and not the goals of the potential applicant. Many other gamification initiatives also went under, failing via poor design, 
that focus on the company's goals rather than the user's motivation and goals. In 2015, Gallup, a very respected American analytics and advisory company, published research that concluded with the fact that only 31% of Americans were actually engaged at work, due to a large segment of those highlighted as not engaged were millennials, which made up a large portion of the gaming movement, gamification was once again looked at for increasing engagement. 2016 hits, gamification goes viral with a badge collection via Pokemon. It is a huge sensation and people can be seen roaming streets everywhere searching for the best Pokemon, arguably one of the most successful applications in history. Niantic made hundreds of millions of pounds through in-game purchases and location sponsorship. McDonald's had over 3,000 restaurants in Japan alone that they sponsored as gyms in the game, which could equate to around $900,000 per day in cost. Now we have gone through a relatively comprehensive history of gamification, we will quickly look at the differences between games, serious games, and gamification. Games. A game at its most fundamental is a self-contained environment governed by a set of rules applied to players, with feedback and progression that has no real bearing on the physical world itself, and usually comes from a point of fiction. Serious games. When a game starts to have external goals or impact outside of the player experience, usually with a focus to educate or persuade the player, then the category of serious games is applied. The player only interacts with the game itself. However, the player may take the learnings and experience of the serious game and apply it externally. Gamification. This is where there is a purpose or a goal that extends to outside of playing and is designed to encourage and motivate the targeted audience to perform their outward action. This goes beyond an internal controlled environment where the audience does not have to interact externally. Now for a quick summary of the term game mechanics or game elements, as this is something that will be repeated throughout this presentation. Simply put, game mechanics or elements are techniques leveraged by developers to make their games engaging, motivating and addictive to keep coming back to. We will tease out why they have such effects in just a moment. These mechanisms can be items such as PBLs, so your points, badges and leadership boards, narratives, achievements and so much more. They govern the player's action and how well they are progressing. As we can see, there has been a long history of the adoption of game mechanics injected into non-traditional platforms, from getting on a plane, doing your chores to going for a run. But what this does have in common is the ability to ensure focused engagement, a level of motivation and increased positive user experience. Now to settle on a definition is hard and has been a matter of debate for quite some time. Most define gamification as the application of game design elements and game principles in non-game contexts. Others define it as taking something that is not a game and applying game mechanics to increase user engagement, happiness and loyalty. However, I personally prefer a combination of all of that, but with less emphasis on gamification and focusing on the human behavioural element under the title of human focused design, which is optimising a defined set of activities and processes via human focused design principles to increase user engagement, motivation and happiness. Now let's start exploring some of the science behind human behaviour, then move on to look at two of the most popular gamification frameworks. Understanding some scientific principles is paramount to ensuring we know how to approach applying human focused design to our solutions. There are certain chemicals in our bodies that are used as almost a reward mechanism. Endorphins, which at its most basic bind to neuron receptors in our brains, and their roles are numerous. They can go from alleviating pain to making us feel great. Serotonin is one of the endorphins and is what we receive in our bodies when we are in an enjoyable situation. It makes us feel good. Serotonin makes us happy. However, dopamine is a chemical that is released whenever we are rewarded for a particular action and experiencing pleasure from drinking a beer to building a power app. It is the reward chemical. This sounds great. However, it is more complex than a one to one. As you need variety, your brain will build up immunity to one specific action if it is overused. So if you keep drinking beer or eating chocolate, it will lower the dopamine release. The result is you drink more alcohol and eat more chocolate, which can lead to addiction. Of course, it's not just food. It can be activities and even items such as social networks. Receiving likes, loves and comments can hit you with a dopamine shot. This is where human focused design can be used. But there is always a dark side to that. In 1957, Leon Festinger produced cognitive dissonance theory. Cognitive dissonance theory suggests that we like to hold our thoughts, attitudes and behaviours in harmony and avoid disharmony or dissonance where inconsistency occurs. Let's take two thoughts that are inconsistent with one another. For example, someone who smokes have two thoughts. First, I smoke. Second, smoking is unhealthy. They acknowledge both as fact, but they seem inconsistent with one another. So this is a case of dissonance as there's inconsistency. Now it has been proven by research that cognitive dissonance can cause physical discomfort. Thus we are motivated to restore balance and harmony or at least take steps to reduce dissonance. 
people solve this by changing one of their attitudes, behaviors, or beliefs. For example, smoking isn't that bad. Many people contract diseases from other things all the time. Changing one of those cognitions then restores the balance. Another way is to require, uh, acquire new information. For example, research that shows that smoking has not been proven to cause lung cancer. And the third way is to trivialize it, as in, I know it's bad, but I don't care, as I'd rather have a life doing things I enjoy. Cognitive dissonance occurs in forced compliance behavior, decision making, and effort. Now, Festinger and Carl Smith experimented with forced compliance. They got a participant to twist pegs on a wooden board, which is an incredibly boring task. At the end of the task, they sent the first participant away, but asked them to send in the next one with the promise of being paid $1. If they stated it was an amazing experience, and other people they paid $20 to. Being paid only $1 is not a huge amount for lying, and so those who paid $1 experienced dissonance. They could only overcome that dissonance by coming to the belief that the tasks really were a fantastic experience. The task was comparatively simple in return for $1, which made them think they genuinely liked it. Being paid $20, on the other hand, is a healthy sum, so there was no dissonance. Smaller rewards convinces people more. Many other experiments were done around decision-making and effort and the relationship with dissonance, but sadly, we won't have time to go through that today. Introspective illusion, a cognitive illusion in which people wrongly think they have direct insight into the origins of their mental states, believing you understand your motivations and desires, your likes and dislikes. This is called introspection illusion. You believe you know yourself and you know what you are, uh, why you are the way you are. You believe this knowledge tells you uh, how you will, react, will react in future situations. Research shows otherwise. If you showed a participant two photos of different people and say, choose one and then slide a picture across the table of a completely different person, then ask them, why did you choose that person? The participant will believe it's the one that they chose, and they'll also justify why. They will create beliefs inside themselves because what they thought their behavior was. This proves we don't know what we want in the future. Our opinions of the future are not exactly correct, nor can we justify what we have done in the past. In our memory, we are more likely to remember an experience incorrectly, and if there's two sensory impulses conflicting, then our brain levels it out. There was a reason for it. There must be that must be the picture I chose. I did enjoy twisting the pegs and so on. This is how we can motivate change in human behavior, as it's also why extrinsic rewards can fail, as you can attach the extrinsic reward to the scenario. The participant is only carrying out the task at hand for the reward, because if they don't enjoy the task, why are they doing it? As soon as you remove the reward from the equation, the task does not have the same motivation. It is not a learned behavior, and thus they are likely not to carry on doing it. They will not look fondly on it, as they only wanted it for the reward at the end. Pavlov's dog and Skinner's rat. Pavlov had a dog, and he found that when he gave the dog food, the dog would salivate, a completely natural response to the anticipation of eating. However, what Pavlov found was that if he rang a bell before he brought the food out, over time the dog would salivate. The food in this case is known as a primary reinforcer. The bell is a conditional reinforcer. It's a learned response. Later, a man named Skinner realized that if you removed the food and kept ringing the bell, the dog would learn to stop salivating. It would learn the behavior, then unlearn it. Skinner wished to build on this. He wanted to see if he could control the actions of a rat. He, wa he went on to provide a rat with a small button and every time the rat pushed the button, out came some food. He found that if he stopped pushing the button, then the food would stop. Skinner wondered what would happen if he changed the amount of times the rat had to push the button to four for the food to come out. What happened is the rat would stay pushing the button for longer, expecting food to come out, but not for a considerable amount of time longer. Skinner then found that if he changed the amount from four to a random amount each time, and if he stopped the food altogether, the rat would stay there for much longer as there was no pattern or consistency to it. Thus, the variable reward was born. Let's now look at those primary reinforcers that naturally motivate us. This is where Abraham Maslow comes in. He wrote a paper in 19, 1943 on the theory of human motivation, where he presented his glorious five layers of needs and motivations into a hierarchy. Each layer of this pyramid has a different grouping of needs. Maslow states that we must achieve the first layer of needs before we can climb up to the next. The levels are physiological needs, such as food and water, those survival needs. The next level is safety, where personal security, employment, and health becomes 
acceptance requirements. The next jump up is love and belonging. This is where community is required, friendship, intimacy, family, a general sense of connection. Up next is esteem, including self-esteem, respect, status, and recognition. And on top of the pyramid is self-actualization, which has become the best of whatever your desired goal is. For example, the best power platform builder in the world, achieving your full potential. Within the hierarchy, some of the items exist outside ourselves, such as physiological, requiring food and water, and safety, requiring a job and personal security. Also, the lower levels of esteem, such as status and approval, rather than a feeling of accomplishment. These are referred to as extrinsic. Some sit internally, such as self-actualization and self-esteem. These are controlled by ourselves and are internal, and they are referred to as intrinsic. Intrinsic reward examples are contributing to community, personal growth, deep human relations, feeling part of something greater than yourself, and contributing positively to that. Rewards that are in your control. External rewards examples are such as money, flash cars, and approval. Extrinsic rewards get in the way and distract, distract us, which can actually lead to being quite toxic. It has been proven that once we have enough money and status, we don't actually need more, and it's damaging. This leads us onto the hedonic treadmill. The hedonic treadmill is the observed tendency that people will turn back to a relatively constant level of happiness, regardless of positive or negative environmental factors. So as you, your pay package increases, your expectations and desires will increase, resulting in no permanent happiness increase. As you get used to a certain dopamine kick or buzz, then you need more of it, keeping to keep having those sharp increases in happiness beyond your hedonic set point, your baseline happiness. This also relates to the issue with drugs, gambling, and even social platforms. However, it can be much more severe, where your hedonic happiness set point can alter and your baseline happiness is now set to a point that you can't get back to naturally, so you're constantly chasing whatever it is that you deem makes you happy. However, on the other hand, intrinsic rewards you can keep working towards without detrimental effects. There is a mental state known as flow, when time stands still and we naturally enjoy and are motivated to carry out the tasks that we are doing. The slang term is being in the zone, hyper-focus. Whilst in this hyper-state, we are ignorant to all the extrinsic rewards around us. It's impossible to give flow artificially as it's a state, but we have the ability to provide the environment to get into that estate. Items such as money and physical rewards make it hard to get into flow. Now we know some of the academic and scientific theories that underpin human motivation, let's look at human focused design frameworks. The Octalysis frameworks is based on human focused design, what the audience wants and what motivates the audience. The creator of Octalysis, UK Chow, spent many years looking at what made games fun, what motivates individuals, and he concluded that there are eight core drivers. All successful solutions have the eight core drives of motivation. The core drives we will talk about in turn, but what is important to note is they are split into left side and right side core drives. The left side involve motivation and tendencies related to logic, ownership, and analytical thought. These core drives are development and, and accomplishment, ownership and possession, and finally scarcity and impatience. Left side strongly correlates to intrinsic motivation. On the other side, the right side, the core drives are characterized by social creativity and curiosity. They are empowerment of creativity and feedback, social drive and influence, and unpredictability and curiosity. The right side strongly cor correlates to extrinsic motivations. And as we know, it's much better to focus on intrinsic left side experiences when developing solutions than it is the right side extrinsic experiences. Extrinsic experience will impair any intrinsic motivation, as once the extrinsic reward is taken away, motivation plummets. Another reason for this is due to the over-justification effect. For example, if an artist did work for free and was happy as the satisfaction was in the accomplishment and development, but you started paying £500 for every piece, then over time reduced that amount back, it would get to a point where the artist would stop because it wasn't worth it, even though they, were hap they happily gave their work away. This is the over-justification effect. The core drives also split into black hat and white hat. White hat's core drives are motivation elements that make us feel awesome, content and satisfied. They make us feel in control. In contrast, black hat core drives make us feel obsessed, anxious and addicted. While they are very strong in motivating our behaviours, in the long run they are often leave a bad taste in our mouths because we feel we've lost control of our own behaviours. This, uh, this will become apparent due to the way that they are delivered with aspects of the scientific principles that we've discussed. Now let's take a look at uh, these core drives uh, in a case-by-case -case manner. Up 
first is epic meaning and calling. This is where we are motivated because we are part of something bigger than ourselves. Games use this all the time. You know, the only one can save the world. And it just so happens to be you sitting at home in your pants on the sofa. This is what motivates people to contribute towards Wikipedia. Because they feel they are contributing and protecting the world's knowledge. And to be fair, I thank those people as I'm pretty sure I use Wikipedia daily. However, what is equally interesting is the main contributors towards Wikipedia's content are also their biggest financial donors. Another example of this core drive is the application Pain Squad. Children who have cancer must keep and maintain journals whilst chemo and other medication is given to them to keep track of how they are feeding to help minimize pain. However, kids can be too tired after receiving such medication, thus Pain Squad was born, to motivate the children to keep track of what they, uh, when they experience pain, how long it lasts, and the intensity via a crime-fighting game. They use police officer video recordings that were done by famous actors. The children can climb to different ranks within the police system and they were constantly well they are constantly reminded that they are contributing to fighting pain not just for them but for everyone they were part of something huge there are many many other examples such as ways they use gamification via introduction when opening the app the user is greeted by a snake monster made up of a road with tons of cars stuck on it that states let's beat traffic together the user is strongly encouraged to report traffic buildup and other items to ensure that people are never cated down quiet areas so that congestion doesn't build up to beat the traffic monster. Epic meaning can help people carry out items that may be against their self-interest, which can also include taking a longer route to avoid congestion build up. Up next is development and accomplishment. This is where people are driven by growth and need to achieve a targeted goal. We feel motivated because we are leveling up, achieving mastery, improving ourselves. This is a classic territory for PBLs, those point badges and leadership boards. Points are just counters. They show us a sense of development, progressing forward. Badges are achievement symbols. I've accomplished this, this, and this, which can be in the form of pictures, changes to avatars, various grading mechanisms, such as black belts, white belts, brown belts, and so many more, but they must to earn this. It can't be given for simple items, otherwise the, accom the accomplishment aspect is lost. eBay is the biggest gamified e-commerce site. Mutual feedback systems level up from a yellow seller through to a blue seller and also competitive bidding. When you buy something on eBay, you feel you won it. You outbid them. You outbid the other 10 people who wanted that random beer glass. Yeah, you paid more for it, but boom, you're the winner. Twitter pioneered the one-way followbacks. The, you can follow me, but I don't have to follow you. People feel accomplished when they reach a high level of followers. You don't always need badges to drive accomplishment. The core drive is more important than the game design elements. The third drive, empowerment of creativity and feedback. This is the core drive that really emphasizes a play aspect. A major part of this drive is that it is evergreen and has the ability to engage us constantly, like Lego. Give people the basic building blocks and allow them to do their thing. This is highly applicable in a business setting. Many workers highlight frustration of providing fantastic ideas which are creative plus innovative in nature and receive either very little delayed or no feedback at all. This is particularly present in companies that grow rapidly in size. Daniel Pink's book Drive details that allowing workers to have greater autonomy on what they work on and how they achieve it often becomes a greater motivator than providing a raise. Cornell researched 320 small businesses, half of which uh, empower autonomy and the other half actually had a top-down management style enforcement approach. The conclusion, the companies who provided autonomy and creative empowerment saw business, business grow at a four times the rate than the other group. However, the framework states that this is the golden right corner of the framework. So motivating via intrinsic rewards and also utilizing a white hat approach, which relates to long-term positive emotions. Unfortunately, this core drive is also the most complex to design correctly and usually leads to poor implementation. Minecraft springs to mind as a great example. My nephew can talk to me for hours, and I mean hours, about how different combinations and different elements within Minecraft react together to create other elements and objects. But I ask him to name some elements of the periodic table, or what happens when you combine two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen, and I get a blank. It's not a case that he has gone from a Minecraft genius to a uh, single sort of cell-brained organism uh, in two easy steps. It's because the motivation is different. However, it can be 
relatively straightforward to merge this focus of motivation to achieve the desired outcome. This core drive is absolutely crucial when designing business solutions to ensure options are provided to allow the user to resolve the process of the desired goal in a flexible manner without levels of rigidity. Ownership and possession. This is a drive that represents motivation that is pushed and driven because we feel ownership of something. And through this, we wish to improve it, protect it, and possibly acquire more of it. If we spend a lot of time customizing our space, whether that be your profile, such as Facebook, uh, your Facebook page, your LinkedIn, your Twitter, you wish to keep hold of it as it's deeply personal and represents yourself. Due to this, you find yourself investing more time to ensure it stays watered. Once you have ownership of an item, its status elevates and it begins to motivate your behavior differently. This is sometimes referred to as the endowment effect, which is related to the mere ownership effect in social psychology and behavioral economics. In a nutshell, the findings of this effect uh, is that people's maximum willingness to pay to acquire an object is typically lower than the least amount they are willing to accept to give it up, the same object once they own it. This is a, uh, there is a great example of a wine lover who becomes reluctant to sell a bottle of wine from his collection for $100, although he would not pay more than $35 for the same bottle of wine of a similar quality. The ownership and possession core drive also affects a user's attitude towards, uh, towards search engines, news outlets, and any large filtration of content that has algorithms sitting behind it. That is uh, adjusted based on your use of it. As the algorithm knows you, you wish to stick with it because it services items that either interest you or are aligned with your beliefs. It creates a level of stickiness. Up next is the social influence and relatedness driver. This is focused around critical mass community and social value. This is the engine behind many of the modern day platforms. This core drive also takes into account relatedness, which factors in attachment to emotional association and feeling of nostalgia. For example, seeing something that reminds you of your childhood would likely lead you to buying it within reason. The same as doing a sales deal with someone who may have come from the same hometown as yourself. The drive within the framework states that it is one of the strongest and longest lasting core drives. It is a right core drive which delves for our success via our desires to connect and compare with one another. There are many elements that are proven successful here. Some are group quests ensuring a task is completed by more than one or two people. There's also brag buttons. This is where people can easily shout or brag about their accomplishments which is usually done in a way that is more implicit where they can brag without bragging. We see it quite often with badges. Even the Microsoft badges for certification comes into this. There's Next up there's social treasures. These are rewards that can be given out by members of a community to another member of a community and then there's also water cooler mechanics allowing dis uh, discussions uh, like forums to enable idea ideas collaborations reviews and also the broadcasting of those social norms another great mechanism is what the framework refers to as a conformity anchor but can be commonly identified as social norming you know where you perform or behave such as others do to an accepted standard of behavior a company which has used this approach and have had great success is Opower. Opower have been attempting to get people to use less energy, trying comparison approaches such as this is how much money you'd save by using less energy. Then the environment argument, you know, an epic calling drive. Be responsible and make the world a better place. However, when they employed a conformity anchor and displayed an individual's neighbours and how that neighbour was performing compared to them, especially if they were doing better, they saw a huge reduction in energy usage. Amazon also employ this core drive via leaderboards or top reviewers and star systems, but their recommendation engine is their top performer. 60% of their sales come from this. We've all seen the customers who brought this item also purchase this, and the similar items frequently brought together. We trust people who are similar to us and being part of that community. This is a huge drive that we would need an hour more just to provide a foundational layer. The science and various mechanics in this area is one that I'm absolutely obsessed with and quite frankly is one of the most powerful drives that exists, which we can easily see from how it has influenced the world around us. The scarcity and impatient drive states, we are motivated because we either are unable to have something right away or because there is great difficulty in obtaining it. Most of us would like to think we apply a degree of logic and process when transacting through life, especially when it comes to actual purchasing decisions. But this is not always true, as we have a perceived value of items that may be excessively above what an item is worth. There has been many exper experiments proving this. A famous one is by Virtual Lee and Adewoli, where they had two cookie jars, one full and one with only two in. The cookies itself were exactly the same. 
The experiment revealed that people valued the cookie jar that only had two left as for two main reasons. First one, social proof. Well, if everyone else likes them, then they must be good. And in scarcity, quick, they're running out. When the jar with two was refilled, then the value was dropped due to perceived abundance. When there is perceived abundance, motivation starts to dwindle because it becomes common and easily accessible. Facebook started using this core drive. When it opened its doors, it was for Harvard students only. Then they opened for more schools such as UCLA. People wanted to join because they weren't allowed to join. A great designer will always control the flow of scarcity, ensuring everyone is still moving towards the target of this scarce reward, ensuring it's difficult but not impossible to get to. Too much challenge and it leads to anxiety, uh, to, uh, and too little and it leads to boredom. The seventh core drive is unpredictability and curiosity, and focuses on our infatuations with experiences that are uncertain and involve chance. This drive states that as we don't know what's going to happen next, we are always thinking about it. This drive has a lot of science behind it. One foundational underpinning is the Skinner's rat experiment that we spoke about earlier with regards to variable rewards, and this will be covered further when we come onto the Nur Isle hooked framework. Sweepstakes have, uh, have been becoming a very popular aspect of this drive in recent years as a mechanic. This has been enabled by the use of social via liking, sharing and commenting on a business page to be awarded the opportunity to win a reward, whether that be a product, money or other. With the desired outcome for the business to spread awareness of their services and products, but the individual wanting to acquire whatever the reward promised was. There are many other mechanics to deliver this. There's mystery boxes, which is providing random rewards with no pattern. You build up unpredictability and curiosity into the experience by altering the content of what the reward is, such as the mystery box shop, where you can subscribe and you'll receive a random box of goodies. Then there's the Easter eggs. This is like random rewards, but where you know the trigger of the reward uh, an Easter egg is the unexpected trigger. This is great for the word of mouth as people love discussing unexpected surprises. Chase credit card has a chase picks up the tab mechanism where occasionally when you paid with a chase credit card it would reimburse you for that bill. Rolling rewards is another aspect that is also uh, sometimes referred to as lotteries where somebody has the chance to win during a predefined period and the longer you stay in your chances of getting a reward increases. Of course there are many more mechanisms but due to time I'll have to stop there. The the final core drive is loss and avoidance, which motivates us through the fear of losing something or having something undesirable happening as an outcome. There are many situations in our respective environments where we act based on fear of losing something that represents an, uh, an investment, whether it be time, effort, money, or another significant resource, including emotion. We usually wish to preserve a level of our ego and sense of self. Loss and avoidance sometimes manifests itself through our refusal to give up and admit that everything we have done up to this point has been rendered useless. Even new opportunities that are perceived as fading away can exhibit a form of loss and avoidance. If people do not act immediately on this temporary opportunity, they feel like they are losing their chance to act forever. A good example of this is limited time coupons. They are all too popular nowadays with online shopping. It is important when we leverage this core drive that it is absolutely clear to the user what they must do to prevent an undesirable event from occurring. Game mechanics that utilize uh, this core driver are plenty, one of them of which is the rightful heritage mechanic. This is where a user will start with certain rewards or belongings, but they will have them removed if they don't produce the desired actions. Evanescent opportunities. This is where uh, a reward would actually disappear if the user does not take the desired actions. Other mechanics include status quo sloth and FOMO punch. The status quo, uh, quo sloth technique is when once you have hooked a user in, you do not wish for them to leave. So a good designer will create highly engaging activity loops that allow the user to keep coming back and performing desired actions. This will be discussed in the hooked framework section. The FOMO punch is one that is quite often experienced in today's world, which is the fear of missing out. When the late Steve Jobs recruited Pepsi executive John Scully, he famously said to him, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water or do you want a chance to save the world? FOMO punches work best for users yet to discover the platform. Once brought in, the status quo, the status quo sloth technique can be invoked. Right, let's stop there and wrap up this framework. So to finalize, the framework states that everything we do is based on one of the core eight core, one of the eight core drives. 
if at least one isn't there, there is no motivation. The reason why you are listening to me today is based on one of these core drivers. It states that once we know how our audience feels and how we want them to feel, we can then introduce gamification elements to motivate them depending on that particular set of core drives required. Now we've arrived at the hooked framework. We use many products daily, and this includes mobile applications that form part of our day-to-day -day routine. But how did this happen? Habit-forming products are the holy grail for successful products as they gain high adoption, a loyal following, and they actually propel themselves forward. Nur Isle, who attended Stanford University and also worked at the Boston Consulting Group, upon completing his MBA, Isle found a company that placed online ads in Facebook. This sparked his curiosity of the psychology of users, which propelled his learning in behavioral engineering, where he founded his Hooked model. This is the basis of how many social platforms have gained mass adoption in a habitual manner. A term often used is, I'm hooked on Facebook, or I can't get enough of TikTok, and this can go on for many different platforms. What are the patterns behind habit-forming technologies? We notice products that keep us checking and scrolling and coming back for more. Whenever you have a five minute lull, you reach in your pocket and you grab your device out to see who shared the most hilarious meme on Facebook or what cat-based video has been shared with you. However, forming habits are incredibly hard. In fact, research shows that even when we consciously change our routines, the neural pathways of the old habits remain there, ready for us to quickly walk back down. This is the reason why alcoholics that have gone through a detox program find it so hard to stay on the path of sobriety. We know repetition is the key to habit forming, and if it cannot be re uh, repeated, the new habit has to be effective and productive enough for the individual to adopt it successfully. Due to only having a around five minutes left, I'm going to have to summarize this rather quickly and fast forward straight into the model itself, which will lead to unfortunately skipping most of the academic studies that underpin this model. The hooked model is a cycle which consists of four stages, which are the trigger, an event that gets us to try a product for the first time or even re-engage with a product. The trigger themselves can be internal or external. The external triggers inform you of what to do next. These can be those pesky push notifications we are so drawn to on our phone, such as, hey, Chris commented on your status, click here to respond to him. It can be items on a page like an infinity scroller causing you to continue scrolling through the epic content of awesomeness on Facebook videos, or even those really annoying email reminders. Internal triggers, on the other hand, are the true prompts for why we take such actions, but are harder to store digitally. They are stored inside a user's brain autom and automatically manifest there. Emotions play a powerful internal trigger. Feeling happy, boredom, excitement, loneliness, etc. And users can associate emotions to what the action will be. For example, oh well, what an epic picture. I must upload it to Instagram with a billion hashtags. Gradually, these associations cement into habits. The trigger to be effective must be a simple set of cues that lead to action. Otherwise, the user is likely not to engage with it. The action is the next step. What is it the user needs to do to use the platform or continue using the platform? The trigger informs the user what to do next, but if the action does not take place, then the trigger was pointless. According to Dr. Fogg at Stanford, there are three ingredients needed to initiate a behavior. The user must have motivation, the user must have the ability to complete the action, and a trigger must uh, present to activate the behavior. In general, as we learn from oct Octalysis, human motivation usually consists of simple goals, such as avoiding pain, seeking pleasures, seeking hope, avoiding fear, seeking social acceptance and of course avoiding rejection. The action, especially the initial action, must be simple. Obstacles must be removed that, that may stand in the user's way. For example, an easy registration via authenticating through Facebook or your Google accounts to quickly sign up. If the registration is too laborious, it is likely users will not bother, or the call to action to register is too complex, then it will fail. Ability is the capacity to do a particular behavior. Now, the variable reward. The hopefully intrinsic white hat reward that we get from the interaction of engaging with the platform. The user must be rewarded for taking the action, which will reinforce their motivation for taking the action in the first place. There has been studies into what makes us crave rewards. One particular was by Olds and Milner, which concluded in the fact that we are drawn to rewards not due to receiving the reward itself, but the need to alleviate the craving for it. The stress of desire compels us. There are many other reward types that were covered in the Octalysis framework. Our brains are adapted to seek rewards that make us feel accepted, attractive, important and included. 
This is our tribe mentality and the reason why social network reward mechanisms work incredibly well. The investment is something that the user contributes back to the platform. Before users really create the mental association with the solution, it is important they contribute something back to it, that they invest within it. There is a psychological approach known as the escalation of commitment, also known as the IKEA effect. The more users invest time and effort into a product or service, the more they value it. There is ample evidence to suggest that our labor leads to love. This was studied with people purchasing furniture from Ikea, which concluded with the fact that they that because they built it, it meant they valued it more. We irrationally value our efforts. LinkedIn found that the more information users invested in the site, the more committed they became. So prompting them via triggers and certain mechanics to input further information was a route to success. The investment is the anticipation of future rewards. This cycle then repeats constantly and ensures people stay hooked or using octalysis reasoning keeps the status quo sloth active. Due to time, I can only give you a brief overview of this framework. However, merging the information from octalysis and the hooked framework gives you a very thorough overview into human focused design. We now move on to the last brief part of this presentation, a quick peek at when human focused design may be missing. Now with the ability to create habit forming platforms as well as know how people are motivated and how to ensure we can create engagement, it goes without saying that I'm Unfortunately, it could possibly be misused. There are many examples I can provide here, but to do a quick one minute overview of some, let's start with Sesame Credit, which is China's social scoring system. Users are provided with a score that is based on a user's behavior across various platforms. The platforms can include financial platforms, ones that track personal characteristics such as Facebook, etc., uh, interpersonal relationships, and more. This can help influence decisions from being allowed to buy plane tickets to buying property and lots more, which will all be based around your, your, your social scoring. Up next is gambling and social networks. As we know how to ensure people are engaged and hooked, it is easy to use this for possibly unethical gain, such as getting people addicted to gambling and spending a crazy amount of time scrolling through social networks. Up next is Brexit. During the Brexit campaign, and actually even the Trump election campaign, elements of gamification and filtered bias was used to coerce people into voting, leveraging surveys, communities and targeted community invites, and also purposely spreading dishonest or emotive posts. Now, for those interested in this, because it's a huge subject, look up uh, anything to do with Cambridge Analytica, you'll find a ton of information there. Now. Beyond that is filtered bias, which actually did go hand in hand with what Cambridge Analytica did. But Facebook, Google uh, and various other social news platforms alike have to deal with large volumes of data. To do this, they filter what you see based on preferences and previous searches. This is useful, but can lead to issues, especially misinformation. Conspiracy theorists will get to a point where they are only presented information that supports their conspiracies or their ways of thinking, even if the information is not correct. Platforms are trying to improve on this but currently it's a huge issue right it's best i wrap up before time runs out so thank you so much for listening and although this has been incredibly fast paced and quite intense uh, in regards to the presentation i do hope that you've learned something new and it has inspired you to go forth and learn more about human focused design thank you so much